The title of today's message is Heavy Lifting. And as Matt um, reminded us, we're in the middle of a short series leading up to our Vision Sunday on prayer. And uh, it's something that we like to commit ourselves to each year. We've kind of learnt it over the past couple of years that it is a good and worthwhile thing to focus ourselves on prayer as we lead into a season of seeking God for His best and His purpose and His direction for the year ahead. And so as we together as the church, you know, on November 3, we're going to cast vision for the year that's to come. Um, but for right now, we're, we're, um, we're intentionally taking some time to pause in prayer and seek God for his voice in our lives over the next year, both individually and in our church community. And so the title of today's message is Heavy Lifting. And there's a lot of talk about heavy lifting in my house. I know, for a very female dominant household, there's a lot of talk about lifting. And uh, I guess like father, like son, uh, Luke has moulded his son in his own image. And we now have a father and son duo going to the gym quite often in our house and then coming home and talking about various amounts of heavy lifting that they are or are not able to do. And I don't really know what any of it means. And in fact, my eyes begin to glaze over when the talk about how many kilos of this on this particular exercise for how many sets or whatever the terms are um, starts happening. But it means a lot to them. And so, you know, I try to be supportive. But that's not the kind of heavy lifting that I'm here to talk about today. I'm talking about the kind of heavy lifting that you need when life feels heavy. Because I don't know about you, but life sometimes feels heavy for me. Life feels heavy for me when people I love are in pain. Life feels heavy for me when it feels like everyone wants a piece of me and there's not enough to go around. I'm a mum of four, so that's some, that happens quite often. Um, life feels heavy for me when it feels like there's too much to do and too little time. Life feels heavy for me even when, um, you know, relationships change. You know, over the course of your lifetime, your really core relationships, they change quite often. And I've found that even in my parenting, just when I kind of start to feel like I've got one season of parenting nailed, my kids grow a little bit more and they change a little bit more and then I'm all at sea again and I feel heavy because I don't know, I feel sometimes like I haven't got what it takes to lead them through the next stage and season and keep leading them toward Jesus in my parenting. I'm prepared to be transparent and tell you that sometimes I feel heavy because I wonder if my best days are behind me. And uh, I'm post 40, so that means, you know, for me, that was quite a a confronting experience to turn 40 and realise that maybe I'm turning the page to the second half of my life and are my best days behind me? Is uh, Can I really trust God and believe that there's the best is always yet to come? Or as I like to say, that good things are coming. Well, it comforts me. I don't know if you feel the same way as me, but it comforts me to know that Jesus himself felt the same way as I sometimes do. Life was actually heavy for Jesus sometimes too. And I was reading a story about Jesus this week. And actually, I was reading lots of stories about Jesus this week. But this one really jumped out at me because... Um, It's at a time in Jesus' life when people are really starting to understand who he is or even they don't really understand who he is but they know that he's got something that they want and desperately need and so they're starting to follow him around in crowds because they can see he's got this supernatural power to heal them of all their diseases and afflictions And, um, and yet Jesus has this thing happen in his personal life which is that his cousin, John the Baptist, so I don't know if you know the story, but John the Baptist and Jesus are only three months apart in age. They're the cousins who grew up together. And, you know, in fact, John the Baptist's mother, Elizabeth, she became pregnant by a miracle. She conceived, she was always unable to have children, and then she conceives this baby by the power of God. And, uh, and, and her and her husband are told that this son, this child, will be the one who heralds the way 
of the Messiah. He'll be the one calling people towards the Messiah. And then only three months later, Mary, the mother of Jesus, she conceives by the power of God, this miraculous child who'll be the saviour of the earth. And they, they, these two kids grow up together. And John the Baptist, true to what was prophesied about him, he lives a large part of his life in the desert, this really difficult on mission kind of life and um, calling people to hear that the Messiah is coming, that the time that we've longed and dreamed about is on its way and it's a person and he's coming. And then he gets the great honour of baptising his cousin Jesus in water. He's a baptizer and he's known. He's got this reputation as a baptizer and he baptizes Jesus in water. And then he gets to be there in the water with Jesus as Jesus comes out of the water and the dove lands on him and he's baptized in the Holy Spirit. He gets to be there with his cousin Jesus in this moment. We'll fast forward just a little bit. And Herod, the king of the time, is getting very deeply insecure about this man, Jesus, who has this supernatural power and this clear authority to lead and speak to people and lead them toward God. And, um, and long story short, on a whim, at the request of his daughter, he has John beheaded and brought to him, his head brought to him on a tray at a party in a, in a time of mockery and in a, in a feeble attempt to undermine the power and authority of Jesus and the message that he was bringing. It says, after all that, that was obviously my interpretation, but here's a bit of Bible. Matthew 14 says, Later John's disciples came for his body and buried it. And then they went and told Jesus what had happened. I mean, just put yourself in Jesus' shoes that day. He's doing what he's been called to do. And then his cousin that he grew up with, he finds out he's been killed. As soon as Jesus heard the news, he left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. He did what we all do when we are faced with heaviness and when we need to grieve, we retreat because we need to be alone to process our feelings. But the crowds heard where he was headed and followed on foot from many towns. Still, Jesus, he's in this moment of getting, receiving terrible news. His, his loved, dearly loved cousin has been killed on a whim he wants to be alone. He retreats. And yet because his reputation is so great, people come from many towns to follow him because they're so desperate for what he's got. And so even in his heaviness, Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Even in his moment, where he felt heavy, he was still even heavy with compassion for hurting people and he healed them. Everyone wants a piece of Jesus and yet he's suffering a great personal loss and needs to be alone to grieve. He knows he's the, the only one who can lift these people's diseases so he performs many miracles and then what happens, the very next part of this story is that the crowd is so large and Jesus has been there teaching them and healing them for so long that they get hungry and they've run out of food. And the next part of the story is Jesus feeding the 5,000 men, which means probably 20,000 people performing one of the great miracles. So he goes from hearing the news that his cousin has been beheaded to trying to retreat to be alone, to deal with his heaviness and grieve the loss of his cousin, to being 
moved by compassion to heal many people to the crowd growing to 20,000 people and being there for so long that the food runs out to performing another miracle to feed the huge crowd of people and continue to teach his disciples what life in his kingdom looks like. And so it goes on after all that to say in Mark 6, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and head across the lake to Bethsaida while he sent the people home. This time he insisted, disciples, hop in the boat, go to the next place. Crowd, go home. You're free. You've been healed of all your diseases. And after telling everyone goodbye, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Because what did Jesus know and what is the powerful lesson that he teaches us in his moment of heaviness, in his moment of feeling grief and all of the complex human emotions that he came to show us how to deal with? He shows us this, let prayer do the heavy lifting. He knows he needs to retreat and be alone so he can let prayer do the heavy lifting. You know, this has become a mantra for me over the past couple of months because my life has dramatically shifted in a whole bunch of areas all all at once, all of a sudden. And um, change, while often good, is unsettling and it requires transformation in us, even if it's good change. And that can feel heavy. And I'm totally aware of how much I don't yet have everything I need to outwork the next part of God's assignment for me. So I've been forced to hand my burdens over to God through prayer and let prayer do the heavy lifting of the things I'm not strong enough to carry. So how do we let prayer do the heavy lifting? Well, I've got a process for you and I'm right in the business of writing processes at the moment because as some of you may be aware, uh, Luke and I are starting a new business uh, for the provision of our family and uh, part of that business plan involves me kind of trying to distill down 30 or so odd years of um, cooking experience, um, including, you know, um, including... So here's, here's the thing, I'm not, I'm not boasting, but because I've been in ministry a long time, who knew ministry was so much about cooking? But it makes sense because, you know, um, where God's people gather, there's always food. So what, I can, what I've learned to do is that I can prep a dinner for 60 people in one hour of my time. But that's because I'm 44 years old and I've been practicing for a long time. And in the process of starting a new business, I'm trying to distill all of those processes and all of that experience down into a simple uh, process or simple set of processes so that young people, teenagers, can do some of the work of the business. And similarly, in my 40 or so odd years of following Jesus, I've learned a little bit about how to, how to uh, bring myself in prayer to God and allow him to lift my heavy burdens. And so I just want to share with you, you can take notes if you like, my simple five-step process for letting prayer do the heavy lifting in our lives. Are you ready? Okay, step one. They are sequential. It's a five-step process. Step one is slow down and pause. You know, Luke did such a great job of leading us into that kind of an experience in our time of worship together this morning. But that's something that you can practice all on your own when you're in your own moment of prayer. Prayer is simply slowing down sometimes and pausing throughout the day. In fact, there's a word right throughout the Psalms, um, which is... I'm going to say sila because it sounds nice, right? Sila. And there is some conjecture about the true definition of that word, but it's thought to be a musical direction. Uh, much like if you're a musician, our modern pause symbol, you know, the arch with the dot inside it, pause symbol in music. So it's a, because the Psalms are all songs, it's an 
actual literal direction in much the same way Mozart or Beethoven give us actual directions about the timing and the flow and the pausing and the speeding up in the music that we're familiar with in our world. In the Psalms, this word silah was most likely used as a really direct instruction to the musicians to pause and reflect and just allow a bit of space and room to move. You'll find that word, if you read the Psalms, often at the end of a stanza. Just pause for a moment. Just don't just keep scrolling. Just don't just keep reading and moving on to the next thing, but just slow down long enough to actually pause. Because it's impossible to be aware of God's presence and allow him to carry our heavy burdens when we're rushed. It's literally impossible. Rushing usually indicates that we're trying to solve our problems ourselves with our limited human strength. But slowing down indicates our willingness to hand the reins back to God because our temptation is to speed up when it feels like there's too much to do and too little time. And God wants us to slow down long enough to pause and remember, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Lamentations 3.28 says, When life is heavy and hard to take, go off by yourself, just like Jesus. Enter the silence. Bow down in prayer. Don't ask questions. Wait for hope to appear. Don't run from trouble. Take it full face. The worst is never the worst. Oh, so good. When life is heavy and hard to take, go off by yourself. Enter the silence. Bow down in prayer. Don't ask questions. Wait for hope to appear. Step one, slow down and pause. Step two in our process of letting prayer do the heavy lifting is that when you slow down and pause, it's only then that you can become aware of God's presence. I've taken in my life, when I feel rushed, when I feel overwhelmed, which is quite often lately, when I feel like there's too much to do in too little time, when I feel like the list is so long and I don't even know where, when, where to go, when I feel like the, there's mentally 25 tabs open and physically 35 tabs open on the screen ahead of me and I don't know what to do next, I slow down and I literally, either in my mind, out loud if I'm by myself, I start singing the beginning of that song we were just singing. I breathe you in. I breathe you in. Come fill me, Holy Spirit, with your mighty rushing wind. I breathe you in. I breathe you in. When you come all of a sudden, I am strong again. And it just takes that much and a bit of deep breathing to remind me that I'm surrounded by the presence of God and that he fights my battles and that it's him who renews my strength. Psalm 141 says, God, come close, come quickly, open your ears. It's my voice you're hearing. I'm here, God. Treat my prayer as sweet incense rising. My raised hands are my evening prayers. When we slow down and pause long enough, we can become aware of God's presence. And then 
We can tell God everything that we're feeling. And he invites us to do it. You know, this is one of my life verses that you're going to see up on the screen. Philippians 4, 6. I love it in the message because it's memorable. And I often um, recite this to myself through the day as well. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. And before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. And, you know, I put the the Passion Translation in here as well. I don't know if you can go back a slide, guys, where it says, don't be pulled in different directions or worried. Be saturated in prayer. Tell him every detail of your life. Tell him every detail of your life. You know, there's, there's an interesting thing that's in this verse that you can miss, which is that it says, let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. When I was a kid, we were taught to bring our thanksgiving first. We were taught that a great way to pray is to bring God the things that you're thankful for. And what I've learned is that it's actually true. There's a powerful principle in this passage in Philippians. Because while God is saying, yes, bring me all your concerns. Tell me how you feel. I'm up for it. I can handle it. You know, he loved David. He said David was a man after his own heart. And he was the kind of guy that just poured his feelings out on the page. Every kind of feeling from the holy to the most unholy. He was okay to be that close in relationship with God that he would let it all out. He would process it all before Father God and knowing and trusting that God still loved him so much despite his weaknesses. And yet here Paul is telling the church that if you can bring those petitions with a background of gratitude, with a background of praise, if you can build a foundation in your life that when you bring how you're feeling and bring your concerns and requests and petitions before the Lord, that you can do it from a foundation of always having something to be grateful for, then he actually miraculously works things around for good, even in our bringing of all of the heaviness that we're feeling. And I personally have found this to be so true in my own prayer life. Even as I journal my prayers and I say, God, I feel like this. I feel rubbish today because this person just blindsided me with this thing that they said about me. And how can they really think that about me? Don't they know me, God? But you know me, God. I know you know me. I know you know my heart. I know you know my every flaw and every weakness and you love me anyway. I know that you know that I'm doing everything I can to be faithful to you and to trust you as you lead me. And as I start to to speak the truth, of who God says I am, out of a grateful heart to be known and loved by the creator of the universe, then it actually helps me process my difficult emotions. It's miraculous how Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. So don't be afraid to bring how you feel to God. Bring it all. And then see what he'll do with it. Step four is tell him what you need. And I've said, tell him what you think you need because you're only human and I'm only human. And so I bring my requests to God. I've learned again after all these years that often what I ask for is really not the best thing. And so I always have a rider with my request. I say, God, gee, it would be really nice if this could happen, but I trust you. (laughs) Have your way. If you want to move me, I'll move. If you want me to take a step back, I'll take a step back. If you want me to close that door, I'll close that door. If you want me to open this door, even though it's a bit scary and I don't feel like I've got everything that I need to go through that door over there because it's pretty big and pretty challenging, um, I'm just going to trust you, God. 
I'd rather do this, but if you say that, I'll do it. Tell him what you think you need. You know, Jesus himself said, don't bargain with God. Be direct. Ask for what you need. This isn't a cat and mouse hide and seek game we're in. Jesus said it. Be direct. Ask for what you need. Don't bargain with God. He, he won't be manipulated. <laughs> you know, when I was a kid and I would go for sleepovers at my nana's house, um, she, would have, she would have the power to be manipulated. And so I'd be able to kind of ask for what I needed indirectly by saying, oh, doesn't that look nice? And then I've seen, I, my kids do it to their grandparents now too. I think it's, it's something that's natural in us and it's refined out of us the closer we get to Jesus. But um, I could invariably get what I wanted by just kind of circling around it a little bit. And uh, because grandmothers just, love to bless their grandchildren they get you they probably see through through it and they get it for you anyway and God says you don't have to do that with me just be direct do you need a healing ask for it do you need a breakthrough ask for it do you need a fresh sense of purpose and vision and direction in your life do you need a reason to be alive on the earth today ask for it and I'll give it to you I will not withhold myself from you so tell him what you think you need, but then be open to him changing what you think you need into what he knows is best. And five, step five in our process, we've got slow down and pause. When you do that, you become aware of God's presence. Then he invites you to bring your whole self to him. Tell him everything. Tell him what you need. Be direct. Ask, ask for what you need. He won't withhold himself. And lastly, be prepared to wait and trust. Because once we've slowed down, become aware of God's presence, told him how we feel and what we think we need, then submitted our requests to his leadership and supernatural authority, it can sometimes be hard to know what to think or pray next but Paul gives us this great advice at the end of this section in Philippians about prayer, about turning our heaviness or worries into prayers. Here's what he says to think or meditate or pray on when we've got nothing left to say or pray to God. Do you, know, or do you want to know? Do you want to know what to pray next when you've hit the end of yourself and you've, you've told God how you feel and you've brought your request? So, well, what do I say next? What, where do, what do I think about next? Well, here's what Paul tells us to do. He says, summing it all up, friends, I'd say you'll do best. Saying, you, you don't have to, but you'll do best by filling your minds and meditating on things that are true. What does God say about you? Noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious. These are the things that we will train our minds to think about. The best not the worst. I'm going to believe the best of that person, not the worst. I'm going to believe the best of you, God, not the worst. The beautiful and not the ugly. Things to praise and not things to curse. Do that and God, who makes everything work together, will work you into His most excellent harmonies. Oh, Lord, that I would be worked into a beautiful harmony. Imagine my life being a piece of music in this world as I walk down the street. People getting a sense of that incense, that presence of God, just because I'm confident and secure enough to know that I carry Him with me wherever I go when I'm prepared to wait and trust that He's going to work my life, all the heaviness, all the good bits, all the rough bits, all the unrefined bits that are still being transformed into a most excellent harmony. What a promise, church. What a promise. I've been so inspired to grow and, 
and deepen the intimacy of my prayer life with God. And all I hope to bring to you today is the inspiration to go on your own journey with Him. But if you've never started a relationship with Him, it's going to be hard to do that. And so I just want to take a moment right now to invite you to say a simple prayer which will invite him into that kind of relationship in your life. Why don't you just close your eyes and focus on God for a moment. You know, in the Bible, it says in Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so if you're carrying a heavy burden today because you don't know Jesus, then today is your day where he will lift that burden through this simple prayer. This simple prayer we're going to pray together will lift that heavy burden. And all you need to do to respond is just raise your hand to say, yeah, I need to call on the name of the Lord today. I need to call on the name of the Lord today and be saved. If that's you, why don't you raise your hand just right where you are. And we'll pray a prayer all together, the whole church. And we'll invite him to begin this kind of intimate prayer life with each one of us. Let's pray, church. Jesus, this is my decision. Today, I say yes to you. You died on the cross to pay the price for my sin. I invite you to be my saviour. Come into my life. Forgive my sin. And fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.